Hi, this is actually a question about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I'm someone who I really like the kind of ideas of foundation work, and I was looking online, and um, when I was looking at you know potential jobs at any place of foundation, all of them you need 10 to 20 years. Uh oh. Yet <laughs> you're tell of experience. Yet you're telling us you know we should go out and make sure we do really good things. And I was wondering, how would you expect people to go do good things if you can't have any starting point? <laughs> Well, the foundation today has about 400 people, and over the next three years, that'll grow to about 1,000 people. So clearly, the main thing we do is grant to partners. Um, you know, the grant level is about uh, $3 billion a year, and, and it's a lot of partners doing the research, doing the activities out in the field. So I'll check that job thing. We should be more open uh, to undergraduates and summer-type activity, I'd expect. I think you know, maybe a third to a half of the openings should be you know, in, in getting young people in, getting that exposure, and so that uh, they can be involved in these things. I'd say overwhelmingly, though, uh, even as I look at that, uh, the, it would be the partner organizations, there'd be even a, a broader set of opportunities. So you know, thanks, thanks for uh, highlighting that. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, Mr. Gates. I'm to your right. Oh, over there. Right. Hi. Okay, good. Hi. Um, that's okay. Um, my name is Karanda Baker, and I'm a Master's of Arts Management student in the Hine School. Yes. Um, and my question is, with all of these software advances and all the technology advances, um, we're seeing in the arts and culture sector that that's going to change the way that audience are experiencing our art, specifically traditional arts. Um, such as museums and ballets. And I'm curious to know if you and your foundation have considered any strategic partnerships or if you know of any organizations to help the arts industry embrace technology and then also to help shape how the audience is going to experience it so that we're not coming to it from a reactive perspective but from a more proactive perspective. I'm sure there's a lot of change that will take place and a lot of innovation that can be done. It's not an area that the Gates Foundation has picked as a focus. And I think there are uh, some of the big foundations that have some elements of that. I, I don't know uh, very well what can be done. I do know, you know, sort of moving slightly over from art to design, uh, that that's an area where the skills need from micro companies like Microsoft and many others is very high. And, uh, creating new tools, whether it's expression or other things, and creating a very strong design community within Microsoft and people that we're partnering with, that is a, a very big issue for us. It doesn't get into the uh, you know, full-blown art element of it, but some of the training and some of the, the tools may have an overlap there. Uh, and so that, that, that's the most direct interest that, uh, that I'm, I'm connected with. Well, on behalf of the arts industry, we would love to be able to partner with someone of your caliber so that when we make those innovations, they are done right and appropriately. And so any help that you might consider with the foundation in the future would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Bill, my name is Raphael. I'm from the School of Computer Science. Um, I was actually wondering, I know that software has had a big impact on your life, starting with like C-cubed. Um, but I was wondering if there was anything that's not software that's also had an impact on your life, and if you had any advice on uh, some of the students that want to be the next Bill Gates. Like, I know that you play tennis and things like that. So anything that's not Don't software. drop out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've certainly been incredibly lucky in terms of the support I've had uh, from people in my family, you know, my parents encouraging me to read and, and do things. The friend that's probably been the best for me is, is Warren Buffett. Uh, my best friend has got a, no technology. Uh, he, he stays away from it. Uh, but his sense of uh, focusing on what counts and integrity, kind of common sense about how business is done. And I've been very privileged to, to spend time with him. And he actually writes quite a bit about how he looks at the world. I'd, I'd really encourage everyone to look at those Berkshire Annual uh, Letters that are online. It's right, right there at the website. And there's a lot of 
very broad wisdom, not just about what stocks to buy, a little bit of that, uh, uh, but thoughts about uh, how people think about themselves and, and what goals uh, they might have for themselves. He's uh, probably had as any impact, uh, more impact than any uh, non-relative. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm also from the School of Computer Science. Um, I heard a lot of, you talked today a lot about the future of software and kind of like how it's going to impact the world. Uh, one thing I'm currently on is that uh, we have a place a lot of emphasis on the rapidly expanding field of robotics. So I wanted to know like what your thoughts were on that, how you think that could impact the world, and kind of the steps Microsoft is taking to get into that field or what it's doing with that. I think robotics is a, a very important field. In fact, uh, my the group, person who runs the robotics group at Microsoft, Tandy Trower and I, did an article that was in Scientific American, I guess about a year and a half ago or something like that. We have a, a pretty good sized group, and they've done what's called the uh, robotics toolkit. And there's a couple very interesting things about that. One is that it lets you describe any robot and what sensor systems are in that robot and put it in there so it's physically represented and logically represented. And that's part of an, a simulation environment that includes a very deep physics engine. And so we actually took this to uh, the biggest robotics company in Europe, KUKA, and they put their robots in, described them, and they were actually able to see where their grippers weren't using the right materials or where they had too much shaking in the robot because the simulation was rich enough that uh, they could understand exactly what was going on there. So that toolkit, you know, we're trying to get all the innovations of vision sensors and uh, radar sensors or whatever planning modules people are putting in and get them to be able to work together across any of the, the different types of robots. It's also got a way of doing the programming. So you know, that's just our thing. I would say that their robotics a tiny bit, we still don't know what the highest volume application will be of those. It's the kind of thing where if you take a long-term view, you know that uh, someday in, in health and uh, service things and manufacturing, this will be a, a very big de deal. Today, a lot of it actually is kind of playing around with the different robots and looking at how we can get the cost down. So it's ripe for some innovation and invention. And you know, Microsoft's role is to provide tools and a platform that's one of the choices uh, for people doing new, new robotics work. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac. And when you graduated from Lakeside High School and you got into high, uh, college, the software industry and the computer industry as a whole was not so well established. So there was a lot of opportunity in the industry. But nowadays, there are uh, Microsoft, Google, IBM, and <coughs> all these giant companies. And there seems to be less opportunity than when you were getting into the business, right? So uh, what, in what part of the computing industry do you have do you think there are the most opportunity in it? For example, uh, uh, like speech recognition or robotics or maybe computing applied to other fields such as computational finance, computational biology, or something like. Uh, which field has the most opportunity in? Do you think? Well, many of the problems in computer science are large-scale problems that you need dedicated research over a long period of time. So many of them are not that well suited uh, to the startup environment. You know, something like a speech recognition system that's going to be used very broadly. Uh, and so there, there are more focused problems that are, startups will be able to do very well. The general organization of the computer industry is there are lots and lots and lots of companies more at the smaller scale, some at the medium scale, a few at that very, very large scale. And they each play their own unique role. In terms of an opportunity to create a new company that becomes one of those gigantic companies, uh, I am the, exactly the wrong person to ask because it's the thing that I don't get, uh, you know, that is this huge opportunity. You know, say the CEO of IBM was sitting here and, you know, I came up to the microphone in 1973 and I said, hey, you're crowding the damn computer industry. You know, what room have you left for me? I don't think he would have said, oh, we're going to screw up personal computer software, so go for it. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so you know, if you can make a breakthrough in AI, something that's, say, smarter than humans, uh, then 
you know, there are things that are pretty clear in terms of their, their impact that could be done. Will those be done by small companies, large companies? Will they be in, done incrementally? Uh, big breakthrough, it's hard to say. Ten years ago, I don't think I would have known to say, oh, search-based advertising, you know, that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Now I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, we all learn, and I, I'll bet there's things out there when we get together ten years from now, we'll say, oh, geez, that, that was clear, and uh, if, you're, if you pick one of those things, the opportunities are incredible. I'd say that in terms of advancing computer science, a lab that has a long-term perspective and is really going to disseminate the stuff out there, a very high percentage of the new stuff will come out of that type of environment. In learning about the global health initiatives in Botswana that you par partnered with Merck, I kept on thinking, what could Merck get out of this? What can a corporation really get out of like pouring into this, this money to build the infrastructure? And I wanted to know, um, what do you from your perspective, moving from a uh, for-profit corporation to um, philanthropy and giving, what do you think the contrast really is um, in running a corporation to, a for-profit corporation to a nonprofit? Well, the scorecard is different, but the importance of hiring smart people and being very ambitious, letting things fail, uh, because you're taking on things that are very difficult. I'd say there's more parallels than there are differences. The scorecard in business is very crisp. It, it's profitability over the long run. That's how you're largely, not exclusively, but in terms of staying around, that is a, a big part of how you'll be measured. In a foundation, it's easy to get sloppy because you don't come in every morning and think, OK, we're going to go out of business. Same thing with governments. They don't they can be a little sloppy. They don't have to think about that. Well, so how do you make it work? You come up with objectives. You know, say, for example, uh, 10 million children a year, uh, 10 million ch children are dying this year of diseases they shouldn't die of. So you say, OK, 15 years from now, uh, that number should be 2 million. And we'll measure ourselves according to whether we, in terms of the partnerships and government generosity and things we cause to happen, whether that uh, takes place. Now, you know, some people say to me, don't say that out loud, that's so ambitious. Uh, well, I'm, I'm willing to fail. Uh, you know, that should be the objective. It's a very high bar. It would be a rate of decrease dramatically greater than even uh, the wonderful things that have, have gone on in the past. So in each of our areas, we set goals. For smallholder farmers, we did a coffee grant, 100 million. We want to have 250,000 coffee growers who have twice the income that they have today. And we will be able to measure, uh, that one will take eight years, we'll be able to measure whether that happened or not. So the, the need to bring in science and economics and understand what is likely to work or not, it's very similar to a business. In terms of corporations and, and the, the things they do, I think the reason that Merck did Botswana is very similar to the reason why Microsoft does so many things in this technology donation area. If you do it the right way, the, it really reinforces the values of your company. In our case, it's empowerment through software. In their case, it's uh, good health through the miracle of, of uh, advanced drugs. And so they, I, I don't even know if they got that, uh, how much credit they got for it, but they were part of the $100 million partnership that really created the model in Botswana. Then when the US government got very generous, through PEPFAR and through Global Fund, that the learnings there were very impactful, not just in Botswana, but elsewhere. So it's wonderful that Merck uh, did that. Uh, and I think, they, were they able to hire people in a better way? Was the image of the company in terms of how they interacted with uh, uh, the political environment better because of that? They'd have to judge. But I do think these value-based activities, the largest corporations who are competing for talent and uh, need to you know, be a, a strong member of society, I think they, if we give it to them in the right framework, they will be willing to devote some of their innovators to learning about these conditions and, and doing more work. In the drug companies, there's quite a range of how many, which ones do a lot and which ones don't. GlassCloth-Smith-Klein does the most. I won't say the name out loud of the one who does the least, but it's, it's quite a, a spectrum, and I'm hoping that people move uh, in the Glaxo direction. In fact, I, part of my Additional time will be to sit down and 
uh, give specific thoughts on how people should do it. Part of the reason they don't is that when they invent a drug that's for the developing world, people come along and say, oh, because you did it, you should give it away for free. And so the ones that don't invent those drugs say, yeah, if we ever had any, we'd give it away for free. It's those other guys who are <laughs> inventing them. Tell them to give them away for free. Uh, and so it creates this huge disincentive if, quote, activists, quote, don't understand what behavior they're causing. So there's some complex dynamics in this thing. But uh, we are moving in, in the right direction. And Merck's donation was a, a good early example of it.